Assume the lines are parallel and let X, that guy, equal 59 degrees. Classify, didn't mean to do that, X and Y, then find all of the angle measures. Well, here's X, here's Y. They are related because they are considered corresponding angles. Corresponding angles are angles where if I were to take this, rip it off, and put it down here, it's literally the exact same angle. Now, by saying they're the exact same angle, since X is 59 degrees, that means Y is also 59 degrees. Now, X and this guy right here are vertical, which means that 2 is 59 degrees, and Y and this guy right here are vertical, so that means they're 59 degrees. So that makes life a little easy to remember. The other thing, too, is if this is 59 degrees and I want to find these angles, Y and this angle right here are glued together to form a straight angle, which means they both add up to 180 degrees. So in order to find all the other angles, 180 minus 59 is going to give me 121 degrees. So you're 121 degrees, which means its vertical angle is 121 degrees. This guy and this guy are considered alternate interior angles, which means that's 121 degrees. And these guys are vertical, making them 121 degrees. So whenever you have parallel lines, like so, and you're being asked to find all of the angles, whatever this guy is, three others are going to be that. And whatever this guy is, the other three are going to be that. So there you go. Solve for X, then find each angle measure. All right, so we have parallel lines. That's pretty important. We have an angle on the very top left and an angle on the very bottom right. Now, these two angles have a name as far as the way they're related, and they're called alternate exterior angles. When given parallel lines, alternate exterior angles are congruent, which means I can say negative 1 plus 14x, that's the guy on the top left, is going to equal 12x plus 17. And now it's just a equation with x on both sides of the equal sign problem. So I'm going to subtract 12x from both sides, like so, minus 12x, minus 12x, and across you out. That leaves me with negative 1 plus 2x equals 17. Now it's a two-step equation, so let's add 1. Let's add 1, cross you out. 2x equals 18. Divide by 2, divide by 2, x equals 9. Now, I did part one, which was solve for x. Part two has me finding each angle measure. Well, just because x is 9 doesn't mean the angle measure is 9. In fact, it's not. The angle measure could be u or u as long as I plug in 9 for it. So why don't I take this one, 12 times 9 plus 17. 12 times 9 is 108, plus 17 is going to be 125. So this angle down here on the bottom right is 125 degrees, which means its alternate exterior angle is also going to be 125 degrees. If I were to look at this angle and go directly opposite of it, I have vertical angles, which means that's 125 degrees. And this angle is alternate interior to that angle, which means you're 125 degrees. It just makes sense because it's vertical to that guy right there. Now, if all of those are 125 degrees, I have to keep in mind that if I were to take any two adjacent angles in any of these problems here, any angle glued to each other is going to add up to make a straight angle. In other words, 180. 
So if I wanted to find out what all of these angles are, I'm going to do 180 minus 125, which gives me 55 degrees. So your 55 degrees, which means its vertical angle is 55 degrees, which means its alternate interior angle is 55 degrees, which means its vertical is 55 degrees. So when you're given parallel lines and you're being asked to find angle measures, it's either going to be one angle and its supplement adds up to 180. And if it's, if whatever angle you come up with, three other angles are going to be the exact same thing. Vice versa with these guys. So there you go. Fun, fun. Plot each point on this coordinate plane right here. Well, I have a good chunk of the alphabet, so I'm just going to go and get started. Remember, when you graph a point, it's given to you in XY form. X, when it's positive, goes right. When it's negative, goes left. Y, when it's positive, goes up. And when it's negative, goes down. So to graph A, which is 7, 10, I go right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And your A. B is don't move, go up 4. So start at the origin, don't move up 1, 2, 3, 4, B. C is go, oh, it's a negative, which means I go left 1, up 10, so all the way up to 10. That's my C. D is go left 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Go down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's D. E is go right 10, and then don't move. So right 10, don't move. That's E. F is go right 9, up 7. So right 9, up 7. I think I counted that off correctly. That's my F. G is left 3, down 4. So 1, 2, 3, down 1, 2, 3, 4. That's my G, 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 G. H is left 4, down 9, so 1, 2, 3, 4, down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That is my H. I is 4, 1, so write 1, 2, 3, 4, up 1, that's my I. And J is right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, down 9. So 7, negative 9 lives right there. That's my J. So quadrant 1, pretty well represented. Quadrant 2, not so much. Quadrant 3, quite a few dots. Quadrant 4, not so much. I had a dot on the x-axis and a dot on the y-axis. So that's how you graph points on a coordinate, also known as a Cartesian plane. Of course, points, half of the name of this video series that I've created just for you. Like and subscribe. State each coordinate. Uh, let's go in alphabetical order. Now we know, before I go crazy here, we know that a point is given to you as an X and a Y. Positive X means you have gone right. Negative X means you have gone left. Positive Y means you have gone up. Negative Y means you have gone down. So whenever I look at my points, I'm going to be like, well, how did I get from 0, 0 to there? Left up would mean negative, positive. So let's get that up. Well, I'll leave that there for a few minutes. I'll leave it there until I can get rid of it. So A was left all the way to 10, up 2, so negative 10 positive 2. B is here you are, right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yep, up all the way to 10. So right 6 up 10 is positive 6, positive 10. C, where are you? Here's C. C is left 8, down 3, 
So C is left 8, which is negative 8, down 3, which is negative 3. Now I'm going to get rid of U. And don't forget the parenthesis. Parenthesis, parenthesi. Parenthesi, Psy Gangnam Style. Remember him? Made K-pop famous. D, there you are. Left 8, down 8. So left 8 is negative 8. Down 8 is also negative 8. E is here, so right 1, down 5. So E is right 1, which is positive 1, down 5, which is negative 5. F is right next to it, so you go right 2, down 1, 2, 3, 4. So F is right 2, positive 2, down 4, negative 4. G is right here, so G is left 7, up 8. So left 7 is negative 7, up 8 is positive 8. H is right 2, up 5. So H is positive 2, positive 5. I is here. So right 8, down 2. So I is 8, negative 2. J, there you are. J is left 7, down 5. So J is negative 7. Negative 5. Okay. Am I done? Am I done? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, I'm done. Oh, I did it. Good job, everybody. Good J for job. Hmm. State the quadrant or axis that each point lies on. Well, let's draw ourselves a little coordinate plane and state that the quadrant one axis lives on the top right and then you go counterclockwise so quadrant two quadrant three quadrant four now when you're looking at points quadrant one has me graphing by going right one up one or right however many up however many and so that's going to be positive 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 x, positive y. If I go left, up, that's quadrant two. Going left is a negative x value, but going up is still positive y. Going left down puts me in quadrant three, that's a double negative. And quadrant four has me going right, which is a positive x, down, which is a negative y. So t is negative 3, positive 5, has me going left 3, up 5, quadrant 2. U has me going right 1, don't move. So going right 1, don't move, doesn't put me in any quadrant, but instead, ha instead having me live on the x-axis. So 1, 0 is on the x-axis. Something like 0, 1 would be the y-axis, but I didn't x you that. See what I did? I used slang. Negative 5, positive 5 is the same as this. Negative, positive, negative, positive, quadrant 2 again. So those are your quadrants. Those are your axes. And those are the points that live with them. The end. Find the midpoint. Now we're doing this graphically. The midpoint is exactly what it sounds like. It's a point in the middle of a line segment. We have an end point here at negative 4, 1, and we have an end point here at 1, negative 4. All right, so the distance between this guy to this guy is 4, so the midpoint is going to be somewhere in the middle of it around here. This goes from positive 1 to negative 4, which means the distance here is 5. So somewhere in between is going to be my midpoint. Now, we like to call midpoint M. And it looks like if I were to list out what this point is, I would go negative 1 to get there, down 1 and a half. So my midpoint is going to be negative 1, down negative 1 and a half. 
Now, if you're thinking, uh, you sounded a little insecure about that, sir. Is there a way we could do that algebraically, like math and stuff? There sure is. That's the next video. Make sure you watch that too. But this is just graphically. And we were able to look at the middle of everything by kind of eyeing it up. And that looks about right to me because it is right. So there's your midpoint. Find the midpoint, no graph, and instead I have 2.52, negative 4, negative 3. The midpoint formula says let's take one of these points, doesn't matter which one's which, and call it x1, y1. Let's call the other point x sub 2, y sub 2. The midpoint formula is this. It's a big point. And the x value is going to be x sub 1 plus x sub 2 all over 2. And if you're thinking, that's like the average, it is like the average. Average means middle. Okay. Um, y sub 1 plus y sub 2 all over 2 gives me uh, the midpoint for the y value. Now it's just a matter of plugging stuff in and doing a little bit of math. All right. So x sub 1 is 5 plus x sub 2 is negative 4 all over 2. y sub 1 is 2 plus y sub 2 is negative 3. All of that over 2. 5 plus negative 4 or 5 minus 4 is 1, so 1 over 2. 2 plus negative 3 or 2 minus 3 is negative 1 over 2. So we'll slide that negative out there because I don't have enough space to draw another, another thing underneath. And so that's my midpoint. <laughs> you know, the kids tell me that this is really mid. And I'm like, it sure is. <laughs> uh, mid means like average, I guess. I don't know. I'll, I'll check Urban Dictionary. Like and subscribe. Find the distance between these two points. All right, so I got that point right there. I've got that point right there. I really can't like get out a ruler and measure out how long that is. It's neither horizontal, it's neither vertical. Plus, I don't want a ruler because Jesus is the only ruler that I care about. Or the president. Or the king of England but more Jesus. So what I can do is I can do this. I'm going to draw a perfect line, as you can see me making right there and right there. And what I've just created is a poorly drawn right triangle. I know that this length is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spaces long. And I know that this one is one space long. And if I'm trying to find the missing side of a right triangle, I'm going to use what's called the Pythagorean theorem right there. There you go. Now, what's A, what's B, and what's C? Well, in a right triangle, the longest side is always going to be C, and the longest side is always going to be the one opposite of the right angle. Which one's A, which one's B? Doesn't matter as long as the longest side is C, because you're just going to square them and add them anyway. So let's call 9A, let's call 1B. So when I plug it in, I have 9 squared plus 1 squared equals C squared. I have to get C all by itself, but first I can do a little bit of PEMDAS over here. So 9 squared is 81. 1 squared is, let me get out my calculator, 1 times 1 is 1, and then that still equals C squared. Uh, 81 plus 1 is 82. That equals C squared. Square root both sides. Remember, if I want to undo a square, I square root both sides. And so C equals the square root of 82. Now, depending on what teacher you have, they might be like, well, I need you to find out the decimal to the nearest whatever. So the square root of 82 is like 9 point something. Uh, if you have a teacher that says you need to break this down and turn that into something times the square root of something, you can't do anything here. 82 is 41 times 2. You can't break that down, break that down any further and bring stuff out. So we're done. C is the square root of 82 or 9 point whatever it is. But that's what we did. We used the idea of a right triangle to find out the distance of that dot to that dot.
which and ended up being a little over nine, which makes sense. Dollars and cents. Find the distance between the two points, eight, five and negative one, three. Now I could graph that and do what I did in a previous video and make a right triangle, but I ain't. I'm gonna use what's called the distance formula. The distance formula says I'm gonna take a big square root. I'm gonna do in one square root x sub two minus x sub one, square it. I'm going to add y sub two minus y sub one, square that. That's the distance formula. I'm gonna label u x sub one, I'm going to label u y sub 1, I'm going to label u x sub 2, I'm going to label u y sub 2. Now, if you're looking at that and saying, man, that awfully looks like Pythagorean theorem, but with points instead of lines and sides, you're absolutely right. It is the Pythagorean theorem. So a lot of similar stuff is going to happen here where we square things and maybe square root it. Maybe something nice happens. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But this is the distance formula. And if you look online and say, oh, I saw online that this is supposed to be x sub 1 minus y or x sub 2. doesn't really matter because whether this is positive or negative, once you square it, it's going to be positive anyway. Who frigging cares? So d is going to equal a big square root. Inside the first parentheses, I have x sub 2, which I called negative 1, minus x sub 1, which I called 8. Square that, plus y sub 2, which is 3, minus y sub 1, which is 5. Square that. Inside the square root, I have negative 1 minus 8, which is negative 9 squared. See what I mean? This is just going to become positive anyway. Plus... 3 minus 5 is negative 2 squared. Okay, let's bring that up here. The square roots are getting smaller. Negative 9 times itself is positive 81. Negative 2 times itself is going to be 4. And that gets me the square root of 85. Uh, I'm trying to think, can I break that down any further? No, I'm trying to think, like, if I go and make a factor tree and try to rip it apart... That gets me, what, 17 and 5, so that does me no good. So this is it. I'm stuck. I'm stuck at an ugly number. Now, if you were, if you had a teacher that said, well, what is what is that as a decimal? It would be 9 point something, because I don't know what the square root of 85 is, but I do know that the square root of 81 is 9. So something that's bigger than 85 is going to be something that's bigger than 9. So 9.2, blah, 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 blah. But whatever your calculator says. I'm not a calculator. I'm a human. I'm a human being, and I have needs, and I need you to, to smash that like button, all three of you watching this. Thank you. Find the slope of each line. The slope is the rise over run. Positive slope look like that. Negative slope look like that. What is that? You're straight up and down. Now, any slope that's up and down is undefined. Up and down is undefined, and left to right is zero. Do we see any left to rights here? No, but this is undefined. Why, you ask? Well, if I were to do rise over run and be like, all right, well, let's pick the two points that they gave me, fine. Up one, two, three, four, over, don't move. So four over zero. What's four over zero? Undefined. You can't do it. Now, left to right would be zero because if I were to go like, you know, right five uh, or up zero, right five or whatever, zero over five is legal. You get zero, but it's not what we're doing. Get, get, get out of here. This is a negative slope, so negative. My rise, it doesn't matter which way you go from dot to dot. So I'm going down one, two, three, four. So down four. And I'm going to go over one, two, three, four. Ah, oh, negative four over four. I wonder if I can simplify that. I can. Negative one. Your slope doesn't have to be a fraction. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. This is a positive slope. My rise is one, two, three, four, five, six. So my rise is six. 
my run is one, two, three, so six over three is positive two. So if you're like, I hate the points that they gave us, why couldn't they just give us this point and I can go up two over one? You can, and I just did. So stop complaining, stop talking like that, ridiculous. But this is how you find slope graphically, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Find the slope of each line. Well, it's giving us lines in slope-intercept form. So if I remember my algebra one, slope-intercept form says that when y is all by itself, the number in front of x is my slope. So when, wait a minute, there's no y here. The heck? Well, if I were to graph this, x equals negative one would be a vertical line. What's the slope of a vertical line? Undefined. So the slope of this guy, where there is no y, is undefined. Now over here, y is all by itself. When y is all by itself, the number in front of x is my slope. So the number in front of my x is 3 over 2. So my slope is 3 over 2 like that. Okay? So that's how you find the slope if you're given something in slope-intercept form or something that's awfully close to slope-intercept form. Now, if this was y equals negative 1, then this slope would be 0 because it's a horizontal line. But that's not what I asked you. So stop it. Write the equations of five lines that are parallel to y equals x over 2 minus 6. Parallel lines have the same slope, but different y-intercepts, okay? So I'm gonna view this from the viewpoint of y equals mx plus b, where y is all by itself, the number in front of x is my slope, and the number floating around is my y-intercept. Now this is not written like that. This is not a number in front of x. This is x over two. So why don't I rewrite this as instead of saying x divided by two, I take half of x. So I have half of x minus six. So what I need to do is write out five of these guys that have one half in front of x and something that's not negative six floating around. So how about y equals one half x, leave it, plus zero, that's one. How about y equals one half x plus 68, there's two. y equals one half x, minus 61. Ooh, tricky there. See, if I put minus six, that doesn't count because it would be the same line and that's not parallel, but minus 61, that's just fine. How about y equals one half x plus 423? And how about y equals one half x minus 667? Oh, the possibilities are endless, but here's five of them. And literally the possibilities are endless. I can make a video where I could ask you 500 of these and you would just be so excited that you would watch the whole thing. And I appreciate it if you did, because that's what puts money in my pockets, baby. Parallel lines.